Good morning, church. Thanks for joining us this morning. If you are new or haven't done so already, we have a Google form for you to fill out in the comments below. Before we get started, I would encourage you to turn your heart towards God. I believe this morning that he is something for all of us. will be our anthem song. 
the door The hopeless have found their hope The orphans now have a home All that was lost has found its place in you You lift our We love you Oh, how we love you You are the one in our hearts adore Jesus, we love you Oh, how we love you You are the one In our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. Our affection, our devotion poured out on the feet of Jesus. We love. have passed away your love has stayed the same your constant grace remains the
Before Pastor Jeff brings the word, we have a few announcements. We are meeting tomorrow for our prayer walk at Westminster School at 7 p.m. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be focusing a little less on our individual prayer walk, but instead coming together for some corporate prayer. Um, just praying and seeking God for the reopening of the Pearl Church this fall. Um, we're excited to be able to do this together, so why don't you come out and join us and let's just pray together. On Sunday, August 30th at 7 p.m., we are going to be having a worship night in the park. We're going to be meeting again at Progressive Academy, um, but we're so excited to be able to come together and worship corporately, just spending time together with one another in fellowship. Um, but this will kind of be a little kickoff to the end of summer, so make sure to RSVP. Um, there are limited spots available due to AHS guidelines. So make sure to click the link below and RSVP as soon as you can. We're excited to see you there. We have multiple ways for you to give. Our giving and our tithes and offerings is a way for us to invest into the kingdom of God and to reach those in need. Please make note of the ways that you can give here on the screen. Welcome to the Pearl Church Online. If you are new with us here this morning, my name is Jeff Harmon. I'm the lead pastor of uh, the Pearl Church. And uh, so great to have you with us today. I encourage you to uh, get a hold of the Bible, open up the Word, and follow along with us here as we are Summer in the Psalms. We've been looking at a number of the Psalms that are written for us out of these 150 chapters in the, the book of Psalms. There, there's great prose and poetry and lyrics for us to learn from as God speaks into our lives. Well, this morning we are looking at Psalm 27. And uh, this Psalm is one of two um, soldier Psalms, as it would be, that speak for uh, into the hearts and lives of those that are in the military and the soldiers that would take into battle uh, to speak into their hearts and lives. And Psalm 91 is one of the first ones that would come to mind as far as a, uh, a psalm for the soldiers. And it speaks to the protection and the provision of God in amongst the enemies and how God will go to battle and we can find safety and security in God. But Psalm 27 is a soldier's prayer, if you will. It's the lyrics, uh, it's the poetry of a soldier crying out to God and calling on God for help in a time of battle. But as we look at Psalm 27 today, I don't want you to think of it as a psalm that we sing while in battle, that we, as we are surrounded by our enemies and our adversaries and the obstacles and situations that are happening, it's not to necessarily be sung during the battle. It's what we make declaration of before we go into battle. It is a Psalm of David that he writes of the declaration of faith. And if you look in your Bible and you would see the title, it says, an exuberant declaration of faith. Well, you know, we are to build up our faith, our most holy faith. We are to wage a war for our faith. And we do it before we get to battle. We do it before we're in amongst our enemies. And I believe this psalm is going to speak to every heart because we are either in a battle, have gone through a battle, or are going to go into a battle. But it's important that we build our declarations up before we get into battle. I believe you need to understand that battlefields aren't where we develop our doctrine. Battlefields are where our doctrine is revealed. What we believe in God takes place on the battlefield and I, I, David understood this. His David was fraught with, his life was fraught with battles. It was constant enemies that he was dealing with in his life. 2 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1, reads, we read this passage. The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. I don't know if you're in a battle right now that's lasting a long time. Sometimes it seems like our battles just seem to go on and on and on. And we ask God, how long? How long is this going to take place? How much longer do I have to fight this battle that's going on in our lives? And we have to understand that sometimes the battle doesn't seem to want to let up, doesn't want to seem to uh, give us any reprieve. Well, what do we do when the battle is going on like that? You know, King David understood the battles. The life was constantly in a battle. You think of David as a young shepherd boy, even when he's looking after sheep, he had to what? Fight off a lion and fight off a bear. 
And then when he was anointed to be king of Israel, battles ensued before he could even begin to look at being a king. He had to fight against Goliath. And there he had to go against the champion of the Philistines. And amongst those battles, there was even a battle with his brothers about they're envious and they're despising him and wondering why he's doing this. Sometimes the battle is even with family. While King David, as he pursued after uh, the kingship that God called him to, we find him, he was even fighting off Saul just there in the tent as he played his worship music to break the dark, depressive spirit that was coming on Saul. And victory would happen, but Saul would pick up a spear and throw a spear at him. And it's like, what's going on with this? Then even after the battle of the Philistines and the defeats Goliath, Saul envied him, eyed him. He had anger towards him. And then for seven years, Saul would hunt David. It was a constant battle, constantly overlooking his shoulder as he ran as a fugitive and tried to hide from Saul and his men. And even later on, Saul's sons would pick up the battle. It's like, come on now, when, when's this going to stop? And it's just battle after battle. And then even as he became king, he, he had to war against sometimes uh, people in his rank and file that were coming against him. His, his son was going against him, betrayal and treason. And it's just how long? And then times he would make a mistake and he would even have to deal with the judgment of God in his life where enemies would come and the battles would be on and on and on. Like David, sometimes for you and I, our battles just seem to continue. We ask God, how long for this battle? How long will this thing happen? Well, you know, you and I are not in natural battles, but we are in spiritual battles. You and I, as we come into the God's story of salvation and we receive Christ, we don't come into the kingdom of God as a tourist. We come in as a soldier. We fight a battle. There's two kingdoms, the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. There's the spirit and there's the flesh. And there is a battle that rages on in your life and my life. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 6 and 12 and he describes this, the spiritual oppressive nature that is going on. He says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. There is above us seemingly spiritual oppressive forces that are constantly waging war against. But then there's the war within us. We all have this battle. We battle the flesh and the spirit, the old man and the new man. And there's a constant working inside of us where the spirit is at enmity with the flesh and the flesh is at war against the spirit. And we battle. Paul writes about this in Romans chapter 7. And he describes what's going on inside of him. And he says in verse 18, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. It's just, man, I want to do good, but the good I want to do, I don't do. And the, the bad stuff that I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. He says, what's going on? There's a war inside of me. And he says, there's the, the law of the spirit. And then there's the law of the flesh. And they're just waging war against each other. And then there's the war that we have that's around us. We war in this world. The age that is about and around us. And John writes it in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. He says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, or the love of the Father is not in him. For all that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of this world. We battle against the pressures and tendencies and temptations and all that the world promotes and the pressures us and we're constantly waging war against that so we've got this as it were an unholy trinity of the devil and the world and the flesh and we're constantly in battle against these things and that's why we put on the battle fatigues the armor of of the warfare and the spirit life that God gives to us and we fight with the sword the, the word of God and in prayer we're constantly in a battle and the battle is is relentless on all fronts so we understand like David sometimes the battle just goes on and on we ask God how long and how do we deal with this we have to understand that these declarations that David writes are to be made before the battle, not in the battle. It's as we go before the battle that we've prepared these things in our heart, these declarations of faith, these choices we make, because we realize our choices determine our destiny. 
Our choices determine the future that is before us. And these declarations of belief, of what we believe in God, are to be made now, today, before we go into battle. And if we're in the battle right now, we pull ourselves apart and we say, God, these are need to be my declarations. I need to stand on these things. I need these drilled down in my heart now so I can withstand the battles that I'm going through. These declarations aren't just sentences we repeat. They become life principles that we make our way through the battles in. These are life principles. So let me just give these to you here out of Psalm 27, these declarations of faith. And the first one is simply this, I will live life in confidence of God, in confidence in God. I'll have confidence in God. He says in Psalm 27, verses 1 to 3, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. You know, Jesus told his disciples in Matthew chapter uh, 26, verse 41, he says, Watch and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And isn't that all of us? The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I believe we become weak in battle. We become weak in the dealings of a sustained battle in maybe some area of your life. We want to fight this. We want to deal with it, but our flesh is weak and we all of a sudden get tired. We get weary. We get heartbroken. We carry these burdens and it just becomes too much for us. And sometimes our flesh pushes back against the things of the spirit that we should be into for prayer and fasting and seeking God. And we sort of just begin to give up. But what do you do when the enemies are relentless? What do you do when the enemy is pressing in over and over and over again? Maybe we feel outnumbered and it's relentless. The mockery, the taunting, the accusations that come ringing in our ears day and night. Well, you realize that you've already made the choice. That you will have confidence in God. That you will believe God is who He said He is and that He will do what He said He'll do. That you have confidence in God because you've already put it deep down in your heart that no matter what is going on around you, you can say, I've got confidence in who God is. David goes on and he says, He is my light. When it's dark and cold and it's oppressive, my God is my light. He's the one that guides me and leads me. He's the one that shows me the way. He deals with the confusion and the chaos and brings truth and understanding. I can trust God. Because I already know he's my light. Psalm 119, 105 says, His word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I will trust God's word. It is a lamp. It brings truth. I've already decided that before the battle. He's not only my light, he is my salvation. He's my rescuer, my safety, my welfare. He has the best for me in, my, in his heart towards me. He wants only my best. I will trust him. He's my salvation. He's my rescuer. Whatever he throws to me, I'll trust him that he will lead me out. Psalm 62, verse 2 in the Living Bible says, Yes, he alone is my rock, my rescuer, defense, and fortress. Why then should I be tense with fear when trouble comes? God is coming to my side. He's my rescuer. I have confidence in that. And then he says, he is my strength, the strength of my life. How often David would write that he calls him a refuge, a fortress, a high tower. He's where God, it's to God that he goes for strength. He doesn't go to it, to his friends and the, the ways of the world and the entertainment and all the other situations of life to want to help us through. No, he says, I'll trust God. I'll spend my time with God. I'll give my heart to God. I'll listen to God because he's my strength. Paul, Paul says, you know what? Even in my weaknesses, I'll take pleasure. Why? Because in my weaknesses, I'm made strong. God's strength is shown perfect in my weaknesses. He goes to God even in the weakest of times because he trusts him. Before the battle, make the declaration in your life that I will have confidence in God. My life will have confidence. I will have assurance. I will have steadfastness because I trust 
in who God is in my heart and my life. Secondly, he says, I will love God's house passionately. You know, too often in the battle, one of the tactics of the enemy is to, as it were, to isolate us, cut us off from the herd, take us out of community, get us alone. You read over and over again of how the enemies of God's people, the nation of Israel, they would go after the sickly, the weak, the young, those that are cut off from the community. And if the enemy can do that, get you alone, he'll find you in a very vulnerable place. David says, before I get to battle, I will love community. I will love the house of God. I will passionately pursue, no matter what happens, the house of the Lord. But our enemy also knows that he might not be able to keep you from maybe salvation, but maybe he can keep you from the reason why you were saved. That you would be stopped in your loving and building of the house of God. And there's only one thing that Jesus is building in the earth. And Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. There's opposition. There is targeting against you and I to keep us from building the house of God, the community, the building of house. And the enemy wants to isolate us from that task. You know, I believe it's a life principle you and I need to have before the battle. I will love the house of God. I will pursue the house of God. I will make the house of God a priority in my life. Loving God's house passionately is moving from an attender to a server, from a consumer to a contributor. David declares that loving God's house is a priority. Listen to his words. Verses 4 and 5, One thing I've desired of the Lord, that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. For in the time of trouble, He shall hide me in His pavilion. In the secret place of His tabernacle, He shall hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Prolonged and steady battles often leave us wanting to look after ourselves. We get into this battle over and over and over again, and pretty soon it's about, hey, what about me? What about what I want? What about what I deserve? I need to look after myself. And we begin to pull back from the things that we're not too sure if they're a priority anymore. And David says, hey, no matter the battle, no matter how long it goes, I've made a decision. The house of God will remain a priority it will remain of value to me. It will be a passion in my heart, in my life. And so it became something he pursued. It's one thing I will seek after. It becomes a main thing, a one thing, a priority. He says, the house of God is set right up there. No matter what happens, I'm going to pursue the house. Because for him, the house is where he saw the beauty of God. He had communion with his presence it's where he came to worship and offer his sacrifices to God. The community, the house of God was that place. And with that declaration, he then had the expectation. He says, it's in that place in the house where I can find a refuge in a time of trouble. I can be hidden. I can come to know God's presence. I can find the shadow of his wings over my life. I can re receive strength and stability. David understood the house of God was not just a place to go to, it was where he could receive from the presence of the Lord. Well, thirdly, before battle, he made this declaration, I will hold my head up high. Listen to his words here in verse 6. And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, therefore I will offer sacrifices of joy in his tabernacle. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises to the Lord. You know, one of the greatest tactics of the enemy is simple, something simple. It's called discouragement. If he can discourage us, he can get our attention away from the purposes and plans of God. We, we, we begin to lower our head. We, we let our head hang down. And, and it's a symbol of grief and sorrow, of giving up. It, it's the burden's too much. It's just, I, I want to quit and I want to give up. But David said, no. I make the decision before the battle, no matter how long the battle is and what the enemy does, I will hold my head up. I will walk in victory in the assurance of knowing who my God is and what God has for me. I'm not going to give in to discouragement. I'm going to have courage and I'm going to keep pressing on. No matter the battle, I, I will con constantly fight. I will continue to fight and I will walk in a sense of victory. Psalm 3.3 3 says, but you, O Lord, are a shield about me, my glory and the lifter of my head. You know, David had many reasons in his life to hang his head down low. Whether it was the death of his unborn child, whether it was the betrayal and treason, 
whether it was the death of his older son Absalom in battle, whether it's loss of his friends Saul and Jonathan, the constant battles, there's reasons for him to hang his head low. But he said, no. He says, I will trust in God. He is the glory and lifter of my head. I'll go to him. I have confidence in him. I can trust in him. and I will let him lift my head boldly and recklessly. He says, I will go into battle holding my head up high. But I want you to notice this about the passage. He says that regarding the lifting of his head, he says, therefore I'll offer sacrifices of joy. I will sing. I will sing praises. You know what the response to the pressure to hang his head low was to sing praises, to lift up his voice to the Lord. And I believe it's so important that we understand as we begin to praise God, even in the battle, that our head can be lifted high. We sing praises of victory and declaration of God's goodness. And it begins to bolster us up. We realize God is the lifter of my head. It's not me. I don't have to do it. In the New Testament, as believers, we understand we don't just have God. We have His presence. We have the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives inside of us. And so we have the presence of the Lord, the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's the call of scriptures that we would be filled with the Spirit. We would walk in the Spirit. We would pray in the Spirit. We would sing in the Spirit. Why? Because the Spirit of God becomes our strength. It becomes the lifter and strengthening of our lives. It begins to give us new vision and hope. The Holy Spirit. Greater is He that is in us than he that's in the world. And the Holy Spirit comes and the unction of the Holy Spirit begins to lift us up as we pray and as we call out in God. We can walk daily in victory, no matter how long the battle goes on. Number four, the confession, the declaration is this, that I will have an overflowing heart. Verses seven and eight says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice, have mercy also on me, and ask me. When you said, Seek my face, my heart said to you, Your face will I seek. You know, David understood the need that our heart, our heart be overflowing. You know, Solomon, David's son, he writes this in, in Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23. He says, above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Guard, keep, watch your heart. Now, we understand that our words come out and they declare the things of God and respond to God in praise and worship. But we understand this. It's out of the abundance of the heart that the mouth speaks. What's in our heart is so important. We need to have an overflowing heart of the goodness and the greatness and the generosity of God, of the thankfulness and the kindness. We begin to worship God in so many ways. What's in our heart is, is important. And to have an overflowing heart is one that cries out to God constantly, cries out to God claiming on the promises of God and singing the goodness of God. It's an overflowing, not held back, but there's just a, a willingness to worship God for who He is. It's a praying heart. It prays to God. It calls out to God. But it's also an intercessory heart. God, you said, seek my face. Your face I will seek. It's a seeking, a passionately beating down a path. It's an interceding. It's a getting hold of God passionately. We don't just put out prayers that are simple, lay me down to sleep kind of prayers. No, we are interceding prayers. It is the, like Elijah, it's the fervent prayer of a righteous man, that earnest, passionate, fire prayers that come out of us, but they don't just happen in the battle. We learn them before the battle. We learn how to pray and intercede and how to seek God before we get in the battle. Again, battles don't determine our doctrine. They reveal our doctrine, what we believe. And I think it's so important that we learn now before the battles how to pray, how to seek God, how to call on God. You go to a practice range with maybe a gun or a rifle as a soldier before you get in the battle. You learn how to use your weapons. And prayer is the weapon of a soldier. We learn that before we get into battle. Fifthly, he says, I will turn to God no matter what. What a declaration. I'm going to turn to you, God. 
It says in 9 and 10, it says, Do not turn your back on me. Do not reject your servant in anger. You've always been my helper. Don't leave me now. Don't abandon me, O God of my salvation. Even if my father and my mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. While well, David knew when things could get bad, things did get bad for him many times. He understood what it is to have hardship and loss and grief and sorrow, and betrayal, overwhelming burdens. But he knew that his only hope was in God. He could put his trust in God. And he says, other people will abandon me. And they did. He cries out, even if my mother and father, the closest ones to me, if they abandon me, God, you wouldn't. You would hold me close. What a confidence to have in God before the battle. Because when the battle gets raging on and the voices of the enemy come, that God's given up on you, so-and-so's given up you, don't you can't trust God, uh, God is, is not there for you. David says, no, I've already made the choice. I've already got the decision that when things go bad, I will turn to God. He says, God won't reject me. God won't abandon me. There are two difficult times in our spiritual walk where we're not too sure where God is, and that is when we don't feel Him. And when we think we don't have faith in God anymore, maybe that's you. You're not feeling God right now. Where is it? I don't see his hand in my life. Or maybe the situation is I don't know if I have enough faith to even believe in God anymore. Well, can I tell you what Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 38 and 39? It says, For I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can't, life can't, angels won't, and all the powers of hell itself can't keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries for tomorrow, or where we are, high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God demonstrated by our Lord Jesus Christ when He died for us. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. So what is it that I don't feel God's hand? I don't see what's going on. Well, when you don't see His hand, you can trust His heart. Because you might not see what He's doing, but God is for you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? And to those of you who say, well, I don't know if I have any faith... The faith of a mustard seed, the simplest, the smallest, the most insignificant of faith request that if you just call on God, you just say, God, because you acknowledge God, that is all you need, that God is there. He says he's closer than your breath. Wow, that's pretty close. You can trust in God. And David knew no matter what was happening? God wouldn't turn his back and he won't turn his back on you. But make that decision now before the battle. Because when you're in the battle, the enemy comes to bring lies and deception your way. Sixthly, he says, I will walk a level path. David in this psalm declared that the way he's going to walk, the way he's going to make decisions, his integrity, his character right now will not change no matter the battle. That he will make the right decisions in battle because he's choosing now to make those decisions. He says in verse 11, 12, Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a smooth path. Because of my enemies, do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For the false witness have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence. A smooth path, a level path, a straight path. With enemies all around and adversaries, Different wanting different plans. There are those that are lying, those that are de deceptive, that are trying to steer him in the wrong way. He says, I will walk according to your ways, your principles, your paths. He says, right now, I bind my character to righteousness, to uprightness, to a smooth path. So when all of a sudden I'm put in a place of having to make a choice, I'll make the right choice because I'm choosing now. David made decisions before the battle. So when in the battle, their decisions were right. You know, I think of Joseph back in Genesis. When he came to a place in time as God's word was proving his heart through trials and difficulties, there he was in Potiphar's household and Potiphar's wife comes and an attractive woman and sees Joseph and over and over again, he's eyeing him and luring him and finally says, why don't you come and sleep with me? Come lay with me. Nobody will see, nobody will know. It'll all be okay. No, he said, no. He says simply, how then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? Joseph made a decision in his heart before he was tempted that he will not allow that sin to come between him and God. He said, no, I, I choose integrity. I choose uprightness. 
And I believe it's so important that you and I, before the battle, we say, God, I, I choose purity. I choose integrity. I choose uprightness. I will make right decisions. So when the enemy comes to lure me and bring deception, I'll, I'll say, no, I'll do what's right. Psalm 16, verse 11 says, You show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The path of the presence, the presence of the Lord is, is a path of integrity. It's a path of prayer and worship. Hebrews 12, 13 talks about make straight paths for your feet. Integrity, uprightness, the right paths. Because there are wrong paths. The Bible says there's a path that seems right unto man. You and I, we reason it's right, but the end therein is death. We've got to make sure we have the right path. Psalm 119, verse 35 says, Make me walk along the path of your commands, for that is where my happiness will be found. And I believe God wants us to have this happiness. But the happiness doesn't come because we choose our own paths. Our happiness comes because we choose the paths according to His Word. His commandments, His statutes, the written Word of God that He's given to us. Lastly, He says, I will not lose heart. And I think this is so imperative for today, for you and I, in what we're going through, in your home, in your marriage, in your life. Don't lose heart. He writes and He says, verse 13 to 14, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And one of the greatest lies of the enemy is the same lie that was there in the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis as, as the devil, Satan himself, spoke to Eve. And the, the lie was basically this. God is holding out on you. God is holding. He's telling you, don't eat of something that you know is pleasurable to see and good to taste and you'll benefit from it. And we look at our circumstances today and the enemy comes how often he says, God's holding back. You're not going to see the goodness in the land of the living. It's gone on too long. The battle's been too hard. You're, you're not up for it. You're not worthy of it. God's holding back from you maybe his healing, maybe his joy, maybe his provision, his favor, his love, his acceptance, his goodness. And the enemy comes to get you to become weary and you give up and you quit. Galatians 6, 9, Paul writes and he says, Let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. We will all lose heart when we become weary in the battle. Are you weary today? Has the battle gone on too long? You don't know if you can handle it? Can I tell you that the way to keep that weariness from happening is making the declarations now that I choose not to lose heart. I will choose confidence in God. I will choose to go the way that God calls me. Being weary, we take our eyes off God. We lose hope. We lose what the future we think is going to hold for us. And it's a lie of the enemy. We need to believe that God is for us and He wants only the best for us. But what's the answer in all this? Is simply this, wait on the Lord. Wait, I say. He goes on and he says, He will strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I don't know about you, I don't like to wait. I don't like to wait at a red light. I'd sooner turn right than wait at a light. I'll turn right and I'll make my way back onto the path. I just don't like waiting. I don't know about you, I don't like waiting in a doctor's, dentist's office. What can I do? How do I make use of my time? I don't like to wait. But you know, waiting on the Lord is not idle time, wasteful time. It's not twirling our thumbs and just sitting back. Waiting is an active word when it comes to Scripture. It's actually a beautiful word in the Hebrew. And the Hebrew word to wait literally means to twist, to bind, to bind together. It's an action of, of weaving pieces of a rope together to form something stronger. You take the smaller strands and you weave them together. And Isaiah chapter 40 picks this up for us beautifully. He gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Waiting on God is binding your life in with His. That you take the weaknesses and insecurities and failures and 
the, the character of your life and you begin to weave it in with His through prayer and intercession and fasting and seeking God and His Word and you're just pouring over the Bible. What are you doing? You're weaving your life in with His to the place that you renew your strength. You begin to bind your life in with His and all of a sudden we able to mount up with wings like eagles where we were attached to the earth. We're held earthbound. Now we can soar above. We can glide upon the wings, the winds that are in front of us, our wings spread out and we rise above. We, we soar. It talks about how we can run and not be weary and walk and not faint. We're, we're not wearisome anymore. There's, there's encouragement and strength in our steps. Waiting on God is binding our life in with His. The New Testament picks us up really in Acts chapter 4 when Jesus tells His disciples that they're to go to Jerusalem and wait, it says, for the promise. Wait till you're endued from on high the power of God. Wait, He says. And that word wait has the same idea to abide, to tarry. It means to continue to be present. I love that. Continue to be present. It's the same word John Jesus uses in John 15, 5, when he tells his disciples to abide in me, remain in me, be present in me. And that's the whole idea of this waiting, to bind our lives together with God, to bind together, to be present with. So the flow of God's life can be in us. But can I tell you, you learn to wait on the Lord before the battle. Can I tell you right now, can I encourage you? Don't let this time pass you by. Learn how to wait on the Lord. Learn how to take these declarations and build them into your life now. Now, today, before the battle. So when you're in the battle, you're able to stand as a soldier like David, a man after God's own heart, that though he at times fell, he would call out and God repent and he would remain strong in the battle. These declarations of faith drilled so deep, they become foundations that when the battle's raging on, you're strong, you're confident in the Lord, that there's a resolve in you, that you don't bend, you don't bow, you remain encouraged, a soldier, focused. And if I can say to you, if you are battle-weary right now, and you almost want to quit, and you want to give up, can I encourage you? Wait on the Lord. Spend time with the Lord. Open up the Word of God. Begin to call out to Him. Quote the Scriptures. Pray the Scriptures. Sing the Scriptures. Begin to build yourself up in the Spirit. Sing to yourselves in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. And allow God's presence to work inside of you. I believe these declarations are beautiful declarations that we need to pick up in our day in, day out our walk with life, so that when the battles come, we can endure the battles and come out on the other side. Psalm 27 is a beautiful psalm. Stay strong with it. I want to encourage you also again as we make to our life to the future here on August 30th, a time of worship, outdoor worship on the 30th at Progressive Academy. Man, I long to see all of you as much as I can where I can, when I can, and this is a great opportunity. So please plan to be there on August 30th. We look forward to seeing you at Progressive Academy, 7 o'clock. God bless you. If you have prayer requests, please call us. Let us know. We want to reach out and, and encourage you in any way we can. God bless you, and have a great Sunday.